it's open stack, right? So the, the, the data plane is B in, 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 uh, in open stack. So that's where all the end user, the customers, data stores, the databases that is created will be located inside OpenStack then. And everything outside, uh, and, and the, the service actually managing it, will then that the control plane, just want to be clear about that, is in, is in Kubernetes. So they wanted to have also support for a number of different databases, uh, MySQL, MariaDB, Postgres, Redis, uh, and even uh, SQL Server. Okay. So here is a little bit about architecture. I'm not sure if I can grab the mic because I think it's, uh, it's gonna do a little bit of uh, uh, walking around here, I was thinking. But on this side here, we have the control plane, okay? And on, to the right here, we have the data plane. So the database as a service that we propose to, 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 to that we built up with uh, Linda Sarta and Claudia uh, we call CCX, okay? And this database as a service um, features a number of services that, that we, yes. Is this the one? Oh, beautiful. Can you hear me now? Okay, good. <laughs> and then, um, there are a number of services that were uh, a couple of services, I should say, it's not the number of services, but there's a number of services running on the back end, right? Uh, that have uh, uh, some roles, right? So uh, we are leveraging the, the Kubernetes infrastructure quite a lot here to run these services. So, of course, we can scale these services up and down. I will talk in a second what they do briefly, but we can you know, scale up if we need to and scale down uh, uh, um, if that's also needed, right? Then uh, we have another layer of services here, which is on the database layer, because we need some databases to store some metadata information about the well resources that are being created uh, and uh, and the, the, the actual data stores that are going to be deployed. And explain how that works a little bit. And we have also other services uh, that are uh, mainly have to do with. Um, well, uh, uh, observability. Uh, so we're relying on actually Victoria Metrics, Prometheus. Do you recognize? Right. Uh, uh, we are, you know, dashboarding in, in Grafana. We're relying on this alert manager or VM alert, depending on if you want to use Prometheus or, or uh, alert manager or Victoria Metrics VM alert. Uh, we're also uh, using external DNS and key cloak, right? Uh, uh, for, for various reasons, I'll show you later on how, how external DNS is sort of uh, uh, working. But then, uh, pretend then that you are uh, uh, a, a user, right? And you wish to create a database. You then have a couple of options. So either you can connect to uh, a, a front end, or you can uh, create via a Terraform provider or there is a public API. What you will anyways do is that uh, you will uh, um, uh, uh, create a job that will go into a job runner service that will then uh, launch, uh, fetch, uh, uh, talk to the deployment service that will actually then uh, create the infrastructure uh, first and foremost, right? To spin up all the VMs and, and uh, according to the specs that the user wanted to have, right? So, so if the user wants to have, you know, free VMs, they're going to get free VMs, right? Uh, and then, um, uh, uh, when when that part is done, then we're using another pro uh, pr um, a process here or a service called Siamon. It doesn't show perhaps that well here, but it's this one here. And this one is uh, responsible of doing the database orchestration, okay? So when we have created the VMs, uh, everything is up and running, right? We have, or not everything is up and running, but the database software, and everything is provisioned here, right? But then we need to actually create uh, the actual database cluster, right? So uh, we need to make sure that, yeah, we are setting up, for example, if the user wants to have primary replica, you're going to set that up, right? 
if the user wants to have multi primary, we're going to set that up. Okay? So, um, that's how it works. And then, uh, eventually, then, well, we have you know, some service that is dealing with, of course, monitoring, right? Because monitoring that everything works is <laughs> uh, kind of uh, uh, mega important, right? And we're going to talk a little bit about the principles, uh, how, how, how we do it, and, and how we handle uh, errors in, in, this, um, uh, in, in this solution. Uh, but on this side, we can say that, um, uh, and this is very great, uh, Kubernetes gives us a lot here, um, I mean, when it comes to um, resilience and, uh, uh, and if something is, you know, uh, breaking, you know, we rely quite a lot on, on Kubernetes to, to, to restart it. We are then also, of course, using some, uh, you know, features inside Kubernetes, like Kubernetes jobs for, for some things. Uh, and, um, well, and we are a heavy user of all Kubernetes secrets as well, where we are storing all yeah, passwords and things like that, or keys or certificates that, that are needed, right? Uh, so that's a little bit what it looks like. So here's a, just a summary of, of uh, uh, the, 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 the stack that we're essentially using, right? So uh, logs, uh, I should have mentioned that, but we're using Fluent a bit and then passing on the logs into uh, uh, Luki or Elasticsearch. You can actually choose. Um, so that's the database logs and all the logs that are coming from the actual VM where the data store is running. Okay? Uh, then, yeah, for uh, DNS, then external DNS, uh, R back uh, and access control, uh, then uh, keep log and, well, uh, uh, mm, uh, at rest, we're using uh, looks because we want to be quite generic, right? Uh, OpenStack is actually not the only, you know, uh, cloud provider that we support. Uh, so, so we want to have a similar solutions everywhere, right? So that we don't need to do specific things for any certain cloud, right? And then in transit, uh, when well, we rely on, on on TLS, right? So I think I'll move on uh, here. So installing it, I just, you know, some outlining things here. It's quite easy for, you know, um, to get going. You just use the helm chart basically, and, and then uh, you pass in OpenStack credentials, network, uh, um, uh, networks you want to use, uh, uh, images that you want to use, uh, project IDs, and so on, so on. And then, done that, you then also can specify a configuration where you want to uh, specify what kind of uh, volumes and, and instance flavors uh, that you want to expose, right? Uh, to the end user uh, that they will then see. For example, in a UI, uh, that they can use in, 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 uh, in uh, Terraform, for example. So we have different ways of, of, of doing uh, uh, the integration here, and together with uh, uh, Lintasart and Claudeca. What we, there was one option, there's one option to do the full API integration, right? Uh, usually it takes a little bit longer time, uh, but you know, together with Lintasart, we did a white label uh, integration there, where, where they took our existing UI basically and, and took it in. Otherwise, we are offering some different ways to, to do integration. Uh, so you can uh, use a service account so that you can use this full API access. So then, um, for example, if you have a system that you want to build up, um, uh, you are building up the front end or integrating it together with your existing uh, front end that you have when you, when you provision infrastructure, then, uh, um, you would manage yeah, like users, you know, you have the users' databases and so on, right? You manage the RBAC and you would do uh, the, 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 you know, you would do a service account. So, so from, the, from the control plane point of view, it would be just a single uh, user talking to it, right? And then um, uh, we took another approach with, with, with uh, 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 Linta Sarta, uh, and that was the JDM2. T token, I can I can show you that later on. But 
this is how they integrated that in the in their front end. So so here it, this is our UI, and there is actually a, a button here called the database. So when you click on that button, uh, this UI loads up, right? Uh, but how do we authenticate and so on and make sure that this uh, part works? Well, uh, we are then using, in this case, the uh, JWT, so we're uh, putting together um, a JWT token uh, where we you know, set up the product ID, and this is actually the, the OpenStack product ID of the user, okay? And then we pass in some other things, and then we sign it, and then we send it over to the to the to the control plane, which receives the uh, the the, uh, the token and uh, the cipher is. And then we simply check uh, if we are, you know, if we have a user uh, that is matching this. And I have highlighted the product ID here because that's the you know the the the, the key here. Uh, I'll explain that in a second. But uh, the 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 the, the the, if we have a you know a user matching the project ID or not, then it, we are, you know in either or we're eventually creating a session, and uh, we can uh, uh, load up the UI. And here now, uh, the multi-tenancy it depends on actually the project ID. So every user now that belongs in OpenStack uh, to the same project ID will in this case see all the same of the databases that are uh, provisioned, okay? So uh, even if you, you know, a different logins to the, to the, to the UI here, uh, you will see uh, the same uh, uh, data stores um, um, in this case. So now the interesting part begins here. So, so the, the database as a service is up and running. And that's easy, you know, it was just some Helm things and stuff like that. Creating infra and databases is pretty simple too. Um, everyone can, uh, you know, ask uh, chat GPT or something like that, create me a Terraform script or an Ansible, whatever, that uh, spins up a database and you will have it, right? Um, on, uh, on any cloud you want. Uh, super easy. But uh, the lifecycle management, that's where the, 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 uh, the things start to, to, to happen, right? So, uh, yes, the day two operations, right? So, uh, to do the day two operations, then, so what do we need there, first and foremost? Well, you're going to need to have uh, perfect uh, state handling. Because if you don't know the state of the data stores or the databases that you create, the VMs and so on, you're gonna be lost, right? Uh, okay. Then, configuration management of the actual database. And this is, you know, I think, a, a, you know, it's basic. It allows the end user, the customer, you know, of the database to be self-sufficient and can do configuration management, right? And, and change database parameters within boundaries, of course. Backup restore is another thing that is uh, obviously, you know, uh, nuts and bolts. And even with a point in time recovery, right? Everyone expects that. We need to be able to scale, right? We can maybe start with a most, uh, primary replica, and then primary rep add another replica. We want to scale the size of the volume. We want to scale the size of the VM. You might want to remove nodes, right? Scaling storage is tricky. <laughs> Don't recommend that, uh, because that's, that can be hard. Uh, but scaling is, of course, another feature. Uh, but then, uh, the other things here, so, so these are also not you know, super tricky to do, right? But failover, automatic failure handling upgrades are uh, a little bit uh, uh, yeah, more, more involved here, right? Uh, so the automation part is, uh, is, uh, is, is, um, is important, right? So 
I'll try to explain how, 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 how we do it. Uh, so we have what is called like a controller, which is uh, monitoring uh, uh, the state of the, of, of, of the databases. So this here, on this side, is the customers, right? It's the customers. And this one is the cloud service provider, yeah. the, the control plane. Right? So the controller is then always catching up the state. Uh, is the uh, replication link here working? Is the status OK? Is the replication lag? Whatever we might uh, need to know, right? And then we're determining a state that we're feeding into the uh, control loop, right? And when everything works, that's that's fine, right? Uh, but once in a while, then there are you know failures, right? And once in a while, uh, you know, uh, the the end user's application needs to do a uh, failover, right? So we are uh, doing actually a DNS uh, failover. Um, so that uh, the, uh, we are providing uh, the end user with an endpoint to connect to, right? Uh, so we have, for example, here uh, the, 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 the end user application uh, connects to data source .com. That means it goes to the primary, and then we have uh, a, a URL or an FQDN called replicate of data source .com. It's going here. And we're then using external DNS um, that runs natively inside uh, Kubernetes. And I don't think I said, but all the things that we're using are all running inside Kubernetes. We don't want to have dependencies to anything external. Right? But the external DNS is kind of, yeah, is great in the way that it can interface with you know, a number of different DNS providers. So, uh, some customers, you know, might use uh, Power DNS. Um, some uh, customers might use something else, or you know, and uh, maybe use Google DNS or uh, uh, Route 53. Whatever, you know, if if uh, uh, external DNS supports it, it's you know, it, it, it can handle it, right? Okay, so that's that part. But then suddenly the primary fails, right? Hmm. And through the control loop, you know, the monitoring, the control loop, we detect that the, this was failed, and we tell external DNS to update the DNS, right? And the application can continue, right? Yeah, this failover, you know, a, 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 using DNS failover, we set the time to live to about, you know, I think 15 seconds, uh, so quite low, plus then the failover time. So that's what is the time to make the thing. Then you might be, you know, what, what happened with data here? Because it was the primary and replica, did we have data loss? That's a tough question, right? Uh, we use semi-sync replication uh, between all the, 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 the nodes to minimize the risk of the, uh, data loss. Uh, but, you know, it is, um, as with any other um, uh, databases, you know, uh, yeah, um, it, it, it should not be data loss because, you know, you, you would have the data written on, on, on the replica, right? Just when you fail over and it wants to become the, the replica needs to become the primary, it may have quite a lot of relay log to apply before, or, or, or more logs as well, to, to apply before it, it, it um, uh, can start up, right? And that's the same with Postgres. Uh, it is, we're using the equivalent of uh, semi sync replication there. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, that's it. Uh, can move on. But here then, uh, we, to resolve uh, and get out of this uh, situation now that the primary has failed, that's a, you know, a catastrophic event, really, because it's unplanned, right? Uh, but we are 
uh, relying on something simple. We started off like, you know, okay, maybe we need to log into the nodes and do things, SSA, you know, remote execution of it. And then, no. We dropped that pretty quickly and resorted to something called immutable infrastructure. How many have heard about immutable infrastructure here uh, before? So, uh, we don't try to do any smart things here uh, with, with broken infrastructure. We just uh, implement error handling on another layer. And, you know, how do we do this? Well, in this situation, how do we get out of this? Well, we simply do uh, one very simple method. We just add new infrastructure. So we just provision a new VM, database software, and let the, uh, uh, the, the controller uh, like join it into the cluster, set up the replication, and so on, and, and let it sync up, right? Um, and then, when we've done that, we can do a, a failover, uh, sorry, um, the DNS um, uh, update and repoint, it, right? And then, you know, of course, we need to uh, clean up in this case as well. So the broken infrastructure is cleaned up, and this is also uh, a very important piece because um, it is not uh, as easy as one thinks to, to, to remove uh, all the, the infrastructure here. And yeah, we're not... <laughs> using Terraform actually when we're or, or open to for when we're provisioning the, the infrastructure. Long story short, but we have written quite a lot of uh, infrastructure provisioning code ourselves for, 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 for some reason. Okay. Um, so that's what I want to summarize on that uh, well observability and logging is you know key things that have helped us to debug, uh, especially and, 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 you know, uh, in the early days of Oblint uh, Asarta Cloud Eka, um, we were able to, um, yeah, thanks to, you know, good monitoring, you were able to resolve and find issues quite easy. Deployment of data stores is pretty uh, easy. Uh, the, 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 the two operations are much harder, right? Because if you look here, uh, the same main principle here, uh, that, that, that the, the rolling, the, 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 the handling of, uh, you know, failed infrastructure. Use exactly the same way of handling upgrades, right? So you want to upgrade something from one version to another. Well, then we will add a new infrastructure of the new version, rolling forward until we have updated all the replicas. And then we will add another node for the actual primary that we have. And when we've done that, we will uh, switch over, right? That's a kind of controlled failover, right? So then we'll switch over the primary to become the new, uh, uh, to be become yeah, a replica. And the, 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 the updated replica will become the new master. During this period of time, there is a short service interruption for the end user where we need to, on the database ends, we need to take a look, right, um, to prevent uh, some updates to happen for a very uh, a short period of time while we are uh, unblocking, right? And, and then, uh, yeah, it, the trick here is also then to, to monitor, monitor, monitor so that you need, uh, so that you know uh, that. Uh, the, the, the replica has consumed all uh, its logs that have been sent from the primary before uh, you 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 uh, make the switch over. And also, the switch over is one of these things during an upgrade that can take time, right? Because the customer might have, you know, the end user application might have long running transactions outstanding, right? And you just don't want to interrupt. Uh, uh, a big update or something like that, right? Uh, that would be uh, uh, not so good. So, uh, I wanted to ma mention that. Uh, so, yeah, immutable infrastructure, I can really recommend that uh, when you're building up these things yourselves. Uh, so, a good control loop, immutable infrastructure, and good monitoring. Uh, yeah, that's, 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 that's it, right? And also, um, 
this allows you know for quite simple uh, methods, right? To, to implement, you add node, remove node, promote a uh, node, or, or, or when they do the switch over, promote a replica to become the, the primary, and then you can also then do the uh, uh, and then ha have the failover. Right? That then you know uh, well, that's yeah, that's pretty tangible, right? So I think that was pretty much it. Um, if you want to reach out or learn more, uh, please uh, uh, yeah, let me know. Uh, uh, so otherwise, uh, thank you very much on behalf also of Eskina. <laughs> that was it. Uh, but I think we are done on time, right? Or, uh, any questions? Yes, sir. <coughs> Case uh, in situation of in uh, failover. Uh, failover. Yeah. Uh, uh, they just saw that uh, DNS uh, direct in the primary and, and failover in uh, direct secondary. Yeah. But uh, client side TTL uh, time TTL is very lazy. Yeah. So uh, switch over is text. Very long time. Yes. How set uh, the code TTL? Yeah, yeah. So, so in, in often in the in the database connections, you can set the TTL, right? DNS DNS TTL. Uh, yeah, yes, yes, yes. You can you can configure the client to set the short-lived TTL, and then also on the DNS side, we can set the short-lived TTL so that it's being updated. Yeah. Very very sure. Yeah, well, 15 seconds, I think we're running well. One, one, one five, one five seconds. So, yes, the failover process will take, you know, a little bit of time, right? But, I mean, a failure is also, yeah, uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. That's, but, that's, that, but that's a good question. If you then, if you, but, you know, if you don't like that, can of course connect directly to the IP address, right, of the underlying uh, VM, right. And if you would like to as well, well, you can on your application server perhaps you have a load balancer, right, or you're using, for example, in the MySQL or MariaDB case, connect to J or uh, uh, the MariaDB uh, Java connector, right. Then uh, you can put in there the. Uh, in the connect string, you can also, you know, for example, uh, configure failover. I know you can do it in connect to J at least, right? So that, you know, so, so, so there are different options, right? So, so using this DNS, that's for, you know, I would say basic users, right? But if you're more advanced, if you're a more advanced end user, then you probably connect directly to the IP addresses. But, you know, the problem with the IP address is that, you know, when, when you're provisioning a new hardware and so on, Infrastructure, the IP address, you know, will change, right? It will get a new IP, and and then you then need to handle that, right? But so that's the kind of the trade-off um, you have to make. Uh, yeah. Developer, thank you very much, Dan. <laughs>